Hi everybody, I'm Rick, how's it going? I want to tell you some stories today and they start in Alaska. There's, a, there's when I was a little child growing up in Alaska, that's my mom and dad. Uh, I had two idols, there were two Englishmen about whom I didn't know very much, but I had a really profound influence up there in the Arctic on my life. Their names were Vaughn Oliver and Peter Seville. Anybody heard of either one of those guys? No? Yeah? Oh, awesome. Well, they, uh, they designed record covers, and I had learned about these two gentlemen from the back covers of these records. We had no internet, we barely had any magazines. We'd send off our records by the mail, and then we'd get them in the mail, and we'd read the liner notes as if we were like deciphering the Talmud. It was very exciting. And these two guys, they designed like every record cover that I loved, right? And so I got really excited about it, and uh, it seemed incredible to me, to me in Alaska, that's my downtown in winter in Alaska, that you could make a living designing album covers. That just seemed like the most amazing job in the world, right? Uh, my parents, unfortunately, thought graphic design was kind of a dumb idea for a career and you weren't going to make any money on it. I don't really blame them, you know, they grew up in Alaska. So I, made <laughs> so I made my way to Boston and I went to school for economics. That was something my parents and I could agree on. It seemed like something I could get a job in. Uh, after college, I decided to try and get jobs in graphic design instead of economics. I sort of just <laughs> cheated on them, basically. And I uh, went to this company called MacTemps that was here in Harvard Square on Church Street. And uh, so I went in there and I took a test, right? The name of this company seemed really prophetic to me. I really loved the Macintosh. I still do to this day. And uh, I had like every application you could get for it, including all the Adobe apps. I didn't get them legally, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> uh, I figured if there's a temp service that you, used, you, know, you could use the Mac in, that I was all in on that. So I went in, I took a test, and I aced the test, except for one question around points in pica. I had never heard of either one. That was kind of embarrassing. But uh, the guy giving me the test was like, it doesn't really matter. They're on the way out. Everybody's doing this thing called desktop publishing now. And we're all about Quark Express and PageMaker. And I had PageMaker down, but Quark was really hard to pirate. So I had like... <laughs> I had to go to a friend's house the weekend before the test, and I had learned it in one day, but I aced the test. I felt very good about that. And then, anyway, before long, I found myself in the depth of the world known as management consulting, right? And I was preparing PowerPoint presentations for these companies known as the Big Four, and it was all very glamorous. I wore a suit to work. <laughs> That's me after I got home from work. <laughs> I made these things called single frames. They were like a big deal at my company. There's these really complicated infographics where you, like, everything was in one place. I don't have any of my own, so I dug this one up the web. It turns out people are still making these things today. I bet some of you are making these things today. Uh, the other thing I had to do is like the partners at the company would come and just drop off business cards on my desk. You guys don't have to do this today. And I like load up Adobe Streamline and I'd scan the logo in and I'd like meticulously recreate the logo and streamline and freehand so I could put it into these proposals. That was fun. I spent a lot of hours doing that, but it was good work. It paid really well. I was like 22 years old and aside from wearing a suit every day, I loved it. But three things happened there that kind of changed my life, right? So the first one was that the big four consulting company I was working for got fired by one of their clients. The client was named Apple Computer. The IT department at my big four consulting company had decided that they were all gonna switch to a single platform, including us designers, and they were gonna use the PC. Uh, no more Macs, so Apple fired them. Um, you know, to be fair, this was Apple's darkest hour in their life, and nobody really thought they were gonna stick around anymore. But right at the same time, the company sent me to Macworld and Steve Jobs returned and I got to go see this day when he like announced the, uh, the iMac, so it was pretty cool. I would spend all this time on their Lotus Notes forums, it looked like that back then, at the company arguing with the IT department about PCs. <laughs> I lived my life in that thing for like two years. <laughs> but I knew my days were numbered there, so uh, you know, that was not a good sign. The second thing, though, that happened there was a good sign. The big four services company I worked for had this office in Kendall Square. We were in uh, Copley Square in Boston. And, but it became a center of technology for the company, right? And uh, therefore, they were charged for making this new thing called a website. <laughs> and so I was like, well, I got to get over there. So I started, I started like, learning all these other programs that I hadn't learned yet, like uh, Adobe PageMill. And, Go Live Studio Pro and this thing called Future Splash that turned into Flash. Uh, my side of the, uh, in Boston was mainly doing like marketing and logistics and back office technology consulting for casinos and healthcare organizations, which wasn't quite as exciting. 
But if I figured I learned these programs, I could get over to Kendall Square, which you know, had this new indie movie theater in it, and it was really exciting, it was really up and coming. So I dove into these apps, and I started learning this thing called the internet, and I made my first website there on company time in 1996. It was called stodgy.com. I still have the URL. It's still my email address. And it was this sort of nerdy site about like, uh, you know, the films of Peter Greenaway or the furniture making of the people of the William Morris School, stuff like that. Not a big hit on the internet. <laughs> then or now, it turns out. But, uh, and then the third thing that happened is I met this guy. This is my boss later on. But his name was John Shu, right? He worked in the IT department there at uh, the Big Four Management Consulting Company. And you know, we were both really obsessed with these companies, like this new kind of company called the Digital Agency, right? There's this one in New York called Razorfish, and we just thought they were the coolest people in the world. And we, and we really wanted to like, work in one of those companies. And John knew I like, was into this internet thing, even though I did not succeed in getting to Kendall Square. So uh, he got all the software for me that we didn't have full site licenses of. I was legal by this time, by the way. And uh, you know, he had my back in all this stuff, and that was really great. The other thing John had was a recording studio, right? And this recording studio also made CDs for its clients. And they had been spending all this money at pre-press companies making film for the, the presses. And he decided to hire me to do all that in-house so he could save some money, right? So I spent a bunch of his money. I bought this thing called the Agfa AccuSet Image Setter. The enduring mystery about this thing is it came with a $10,000 dongle about that big that you had to have to use that machine because somehow you're going to use that machine without buying that machine. It didn't ever really make any sense. But uh, I hired my best friend, Jill, and we started making album covers for these clients. We designed something like 200 album covers in three years. We just cranked them out. This is the only one I can find to this day. It's one that Jill did. They weren't really glamorous bands. They weren't really glamorous album covers, right? It was a lot of like reggae bands, Cabo Verdiano bands or something, like a lot of like, you know, trust fund baby hip hop guys whose parents were paying for it. <laughs> But uh, you know, we did so many of them over and over again. We really got to like get our design chops up and uh, you know solid. And we were designing album covers for a living. Come on, I was like it was like 1997, and I was done what I had set out to do. I felt pretty good about that. Um, I had also at that time started a record label with some friends of mine, because we had a recording studio for cheap and we had CD manufacturing for cheap. So we figured we should probably you know do this. We were all in bands, and we got to design album covers that we really liked as well. So that was really awesome. But alas, things did not work out in the recording industry. And the studio closed shop, uh, specifically the CD manufacturing. The recording studio went on for a little while longer. But I was out of a job. So I went back to Mac Temps, which was now called Aquent. They had this shiny new office. And I got back into you know, being a freelancer, right? And, uh, but the cool thing is, because I had learned all this web stuff, I get to go to all these other companies instead, right? And it occurred to me back then that it was kind of one of those pivotal moments in my design career because I'd been mainly a print designer up to that point, and I could have stayed a print designer forever. In that period, especially, all designers really had to go through this sort of soul searching where they had to decide if they're going to embrace these new technologies and, or stick to their guns. And I think we're kind of in one of those now, right? We got all this VR stuff and we got this mobile stuff and we all have to like decide if we're going to get into it or not, but I went for it. I didn't look back, which I don't regret, but it was probably pretty much the end of my design career. But because I had all these skills, I got to go to these other companies instead of the big four management consulting companies. I got to go to like ad agencies. There's this one I did a bunch of work for called PGA in Cambridge. I really liked that place. Then I went to Digitas. I was in this lobby here in the Prudential Tower in Boston when they IPO'd. It was super glamorous. That turned out great. But uh, eventually I ended up at a company called Arnold working on the Volkswagen account, which for me was like the greatest thing in the world because at this time, I don't know if you remember these ads, but they all had like cool indie rock music in them, right? They had like Velocity Girl and Psychic TV and this one's got spiritualized in it. And uh, I was so excited. That was like the cream of the crop there. But because I had bothered to learn all these internet skills, I ended up chopping up everybody else's work and I didn't get to design anything. I was just converting it all into like HTML or Flash. It was good money and it was glamorous, but I wasn't really designing anymore, and that was kind of a bummer. And then in 2001, this guy here, my friend Ben, he's responsible for the desk, by the way. I was gone by that point. We're not going to talk about the desk today. Uh, anyway, he came to me and he pitched an idea. He said HTML and Flash could be designed. They could be the creative mediums, that we didn't just have to design in one thing like Photoshop and then build them over here. We could actually design in them. And he had this big insight that we would start a company that was kind of like what this guy did for uh, TV ads, right? 
So this is a famous film director, and he started a production company for film directors to work for ad agencies. They didn't work at the ad agencies. They worked in their own companies, but they worked for the ad agencies. They didn't want to be an agency. They worked for the agencies. But that wasn't really happening in digital. They were trying to employ us all, and we'd get restless, and we were creative, and we didn't want to work on the same thing all the time. So Ben's big idea was to like start a company that just did work for agencies, digital creatives. And uh, so he pitched that idea to me and some friends. There we are. We look so young. That's so nice. And we'd be the first digital studio catering to ad agencies, like film companies like Anonymous Content catered to agencies, right? Now there are design studios out there. This is the website at the time of one called WDDG, the World Domination Design Group. I loved those guys. We were like heroes of them. And there's companies like Heavy.com. And then there were, of course, the digital agencies like Razorfish. But all of them kind of wanted to either do their own thing or work for the end client. None of them were super jazzed about agency work. And we were super jazzed about agency work. We wanted to be, not just be creatives, but be digital creatives. We worked for the big agencies, not direct with clients, because the big agencies had the cool brands that we couldn't get on our own. We started a company called the Barbarian Group. Magic animations. <laughs> At the end of 2001, and I figured this was great, because now that I own my own company, I could design a lot more, right? That was like kind of a big part of the motivating factor, so it, that didn't really work out. So. We tried to get a person called a producer to like work with us. You know, we heard that they're the people that can handle like timesheets and money. But the funny thing about producers is they're kind of risk tolerant. They don't have a high risk tolerance. Like they, they like to play it safe, so they're not generally super into starting a company with no money. So <laughs> one of us, it kind of fell to one of us, and I had this epiphany, right? Like all my partners are actually better at any one thing that I was. I was more of a generous Robert here. He was like a much better designer, and Keith was a better coder, and Ben had like more creative, wacky ideas than I ever could, and Aubrey was a tech genius, and I was pretty good at all these things, but you know, my well-roundedness ended up cursing me, and it ended up that I took on the mantle of business. The economics degree didn't help either, although it turned out to be useless, but everybody thought it was gonna be useful. It was kind of weird. So I started managing the products, estimating costs, writing proposals, it didn't really help on top of that that I had absorbed some of the words in those proposals I used to write in the consulting days. And for the next 10 years, I'd occasionally be allowed to design, but basically I was stuck being like the guy over there in the corner that didn't really get to be in the fun. <laughs> but today I get to make up for it because they told me there's a laser on this thing. I'm really excited. Nobody's used a laser yet. <laughs> So on the one hand, this is like very sad, but on the other hand, I realized that like, so the internet's kind of a different beast, and the creativity on the internet is a different thing, and you didn't have to be a designer to be creative on the internet. You, can, you know, great work could come from designers, but it also came from writers, from coders, from stone kids who do puppet shows. Uh, and if I'm being honest, in the hubbub and excitement, I didn't really realize that I wasn't much of a designer anymore. I mean, I noticed it, but things were moving so fast. We had all these awesome clients. Nike was our first client. We got Apple in the first year as well. That was pretty exciting. By the second year, we'd won like Saturn as a client, and we were still doing all this awesome work for Apple. And before long, I was running the Apple account, and I was doing like, a lot of the digital work for Apple before uh, TBWA got their act together. And uh, we were just jetting around the world. We were going to the Apple campus. We were going to the like, Nike campus. And I was having such a good time, I didn't really think about it, right? And we were still doing all this cool work for bands that we loved. We did, this is for Freeze Pop. We did some work for Marilyn Manson. We did some work for the Gorillas. It was pretty awesome. And you know, we grew like a weed. And by our third year, we were the first digital shop that communication arts had featured since the dot-com bust. Like, just like everybody else, once the bust happened, they just stopped paying attention to the internet. But look at that. It was pretty exciting. <laughs> I really love that transition. Uh, all right, so the work was awesome, and I was working night and day. I was really working myself to the bone. I didn't really think much about me not being a designer, right? Since the company I was working for was doing all this awesome design. But then as we grew, some stuff kind of happened. Oh, it's so nice somebody remembers this. The kids I work with today don't remember it at all. Uh, <laughs> so our clients kept asking us to do more and more work for them, right? Which was great, but what was more stressful was that a lot of the work they started asking us to do wasn't really what we started out. It wasn't design anymore. They wanted to hire us to do all this other stuff. Stuff like viral marketing, stuff like copywriting, stuff like digital strategy, like games. We started making a ton of games. E-commerce. I still think this might be the best thing we ever made. It's a reveal for the Hot Topic site where you take the old site and pick a guitar and smash it and you get the new website. 
I mean, come on. <laughs> I love that thing. <laughs> the other thing that happened is we started doing work direct with clients. It was just like totally against exactly what we started the company for, right? But the first one was Nike, and the second was Apple, and we were like, well, who's going to turn those down? But then before long, it was like cereal companies and banks and airlines, and suddenly we needed these people called account executives, which we didn't have. One of our clients had to like explain to me that it was really hard to hire us because he didn't know who to call. And so, so we started hiring these different types of people in the company, and then we just suddenly got bigger and bigger and bigger, right? And we started, that's kind of when everybody started arguing about it. So what were we? Were we a design shop? Like many of these companies, like a lot of companies that get started, the partners don't really think too much about it in the beginning, right? They're just like, I want to get something going, I want to start a company. The years go by and suddenly you all kind of realize you wanted slightly different things. Some of us wanted to be big, some of us wanted to be small, and it turns out you can't be big and small simultaneously. Prepare yourself for the worst joke of the day, except for unless you're a TARDIS, right? So we just kept arguing about this for like two years. And you know, we were like, we're still doing great work. But those of us who wanted to be small couldn't help noticing that there are more and more people in the office. And then we got a second office. And then we got a third office. And after all the arguing, after a few years, we sorted it all out. But we weren't the same five partners anymore. Some people had left. Some people had come. It wasn't always harmonious. It was a different place. But we got through it. I confess that in this period, even though my lifelong dream had been to, design, to be a designer, I didn't really mind that much, right? I was in the let's, big get, let's get big camp. I figured the bigger we were, the more different things we could do, the more problems we could solve. And I started finding my clients' business needs and challenges very interesting. So I was kind of with it, right? Uh, it struck me that design wasn't always the only or best solution. That's probably a little bit of heresy here. but. Uh, Sometimes other tactics were needed, right? As the company grew and grew, we kept offering more and more services. Some were design related, like user experience design or game design. That one's pretty great, by the way. Uh, web design, like the Justin Timberlake site here, but some were not really design related. We did a lot of brand strategy and planning for companies like Lenovo, right? And we would do like a lot of just pure backend development, content management systems, inventory systems, things like that. We were like getting into software design. This is still in iTunes, by the way. It's pretty exciting. Uh, we were doing all this crazy stuff, and some of it wasn't super not fun, maybe like social media at the time, but you know. All in all, I liked that we were expanding our options and we were doing more stuff. There's 150 of us by this point. We we're in three cities. We were doing work for Shakira, GE. We were making merry-go-rounds. I mean, come on, who gets to make a merry-go-round, right? The UN, Google, Apple, Red Bull, Virgin Airlines, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame which was very excited because they gave me a tour and I got to see this, which is a hand-drawn version of one of Peter Seville's album covers for New Order's Power, Corruption, and Lies. So that seemed like a sign that I was on the right track, at least in some way in my life, right? I was still like, getting to do things with Peter Seville work. That was pretty cool. For seven years, everything was great. People loved working there, not least, their num not least because their number one factor in choosing who to hire was that they had to be really nice. This guy here is 20 years old in this photo. Today, he's my boss. I thought I'd throw that in there for him. Uh, we were traveling around the world. We went to conferences held by the World Economic Forum, by CES. Ted was asking us to do a talk, but we wouldn't do it alone, so we said no. Uh, we knew many of the major strategic plans of some of the biggest and best brands in the world. The work was still great. What could go wrong? But then 2008 came around. And then in early, in early 2009, everything came crashing down. The markets imploded and brands all freaked out. Millions of people lost their jobs. We had started in a recession, so we figured everything would be all right. This is the marquee from our holiday party that year. Uh, and many of our clients didn't bail because it was actually cheaper to hire us on an ad hoc basis than it was to employ people. So that was kind of a bit of a silver lining. But the budgets got tighter and they started saying, OK, I know you have 30-day terms, but we're going to do 60-day terms. And 60-day terms turned into 90-day terms. And some of our clients went to 120-day terms in the midst of the largest financial crisis in the world, so people just stopped paying us, which we probably still could have gotten through, but our bank was wrapped up in the housing scandal, and the government was coming after them, and even though we'd done nothing wrong outside our contract, one day they came over and they said, give us our $1 million back right now, right when we needed it most, our line of credit that was sort of getting us through this thing, right? Uh, we were like a family, and it was, we had to lay a bunch of people off. We were slow to do it because we loved everyone, but we finally did it, and it sucked. I lost some friends through it, but you know, we still made it through. Even before the recession, all these companies have been trying to buy us, but five years in, 
uh, actually at the five year mark, the head of one of the largest ad holding companies came to the office and, and like I had always originally said five years was my timeline, right? So I felt really good that everything went according to plan, but at, because it went according to plan, I was like, nah, screw this, we can do better. So we held out. Um, there'd be all these stories like this, so I get to use my fun animation again. There's Ben on the front page of Ad Age with them telling that for uh, Martin and John from Omnicom and WPP to start you know, buying these companies. And uh, we still had a lot of agencies as clients. <laughs> I love this picture so much. That's Martin Sorrell, everybody, who's head of WPP. And Ben just thought it was funny that we got, we were, he was talking to us. They'd routinely try and buy us, and we would uh, talk to these big companies, but we weren't really that interested. But after the recession, you know, things started getting a little darker. This is a drawing from our official company history. I was not in a super great way in the recession. It took a lot out of me. And uh, we were tired. We'd been doing this for nearly 10 years. We were paying ourselves nothing and been working ourselves to the bone. And my health wasn't super great, and I'm still working it off to this day. But, uh, you know, we're working on it. Uh, and I had this realization one day that if I'd stayed at Arnold the whole time, I probably would have made a million dollars more over that decade than I had made working for myself. That seemed kind of pointless in a way, you know? I mean, I wasn't really in it for the money all the time or anything, but it, you know, it mattered. And uh, you know, some of the partners, the ones who wanted to stay small, they had left at this point, so the partners that were still there, the consensus was slowly turning, that maybe we would be open to selling, right? We knew we had something really great, so the main thing that we set out to do when we were gonna sell the company, and it seemed absurd, but we were very firm on it, that if you're gonna buy us, nothing could change at all. Like, we aren't gonna move us, you aren't gonna rename us, you aren't gonna open offices in our name, you aren't gonna do any of this stuff, you don't get to say in hiring, you can't tell us what clients to take. But amazingly, someone was up for it, and uh, we settled to this Korean company called Chael Worldwide, and we did this because we really liked the people we were selling to, right? They're really good, nice people, and they seem really honest, and they were like totally cool with all these wacky demands we had. And the other reason we liked them is that they were like lifers, right? Koreans are lifers in business. They're not gonna be like a banker who's at one company one day and then moves to another company. We'd be dealing with the same people for the rest of our lives, and we really liked that. So we figured, this is gonna work great. And you know what, it worked great. Thank you, the end, good night. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I wish. Um, so for several years, it actually did work great. <laughs> we sold in 2009, and for the next couple of years, it was pretty much the same. The company had weathered the recession, and we were doing this great work. Uh, something had changed inside me, though, and I found that the company I was working on was no longer representing all of my interests, right? And this is a really big dilemma I had, right? I'd gotten really into internet startups in the recession because they were kind of one of the only areas of our, of our economy that was still doing decently well in the, the 2008-9 recession. And I realized I wanted to work at one of these companies. And we tried to like sort of do some of these startups in-house or work with startups and tech companies and in-house. And I realized that even though the Barbarian Group was doing this great work, it wasn't doing anything to further my life anymore, which kind of sounds really greedy when you read it like that. But uh, I tried, tried to shift the company to like start doing more stuff with startups, but it was really hard. And then I had this epiphany one day, right? I was like, oh, wait a minute. I work at an ad agency, basically, at this point. And my partners really love working here. And I'm the one that wants to change it, but they're happy. And I keep thinking they're the crazy ones, but actually I guess I'm the crazy one. And I was like, these people like their jobs, right? <laughs> so it didn't make much sense. And I was like, by this point, the only time I ever got, the other big thing was by this point, the only time I ever got to see my clients was when they were mad at me. Right? I had all these great people working for me. We had all these great clients, and I was still running a few of them. I was running the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame account and Bloomberg and some other ones. But I had this great team, and so I only showed up at the pitches and when a client wanted to yell at us. I, uh, and I kind of realized this company was doing all right without me, right? Some of our goals were kind of working. I had these like awesome heads of HR and finance and client services. These are people that are reporting to me, production. All of them were women. They are all great. You should, they all have great jobs now, otherwise I'd tell you to hire them. But, uh, you know, they all knew more about their jobs than I did because they actually <laughs> wanted to have that job, right? So, so I kind of realized I was becoming sort of redundant. And then in October, or in 2011, I left the company. And it was very sad, but everything went on great without me, and it, everything was fine. So thank you, the end. No. Um, and, you know, it was a little hard when I left. <laughs> <laughs> That's Lexi, she works at Google now. Uh, I wasn't the only one there dreaming about the internet, right? I'd been babbling about this to people for years and a lot of people bought into it and then I'm like, oh, I guess they're gonna be an ad agency, I'm gonna leave. So those that had bought into it with me were like, okay, we're out of here. So that like, ended up being this unintended consequence of leaving is like five or six more people left with me. So I didn't see that coming. Uh, so that was a bummer, but even with that, the company still did great for a few years, right? A couple years ago, it won the, the inaugural award at Cannes for the Innovation Lion Grand Prix. 
Um, so that was nice, you know, like it was a little, a little hairy for a while there, but I got out and by 2013, I would say the company was doing well and I was like, all right, cool. So I kind of went up out in my life and I decided I would write a book about this whole thing. I took some time off. I wrote this book. Uh, I wanted to write a book for people like me, right? Like people that had been working and they had a craft, but suddenly they found themselves in a world where the craft was only part of the job. Suddenly they had employees, they had to write proposals, they had to manage a budget, all this stuff that wasn't really the thing they had gone to school for or they loved. Uh, there's a ton of business books out there for people, or like ad books out there about the creativity, but you know, me, you guys, we're creative people, we're designers. We knew that part, we just didn't know the rest of the business, right? So this is my friend at his agency reading, reading the book, it was pretty cool. Uh, in the old days, people would start these shops because they worked at one and they like a copywriter and an art director and a, an account person would all leave together and they knew how to run an agency. But now it's a lot of it's like solo people or maybe two people that are great designers and suddenly they're getting more work and they're like, oh, I don't actually know how to run a business. So that's the kind of the book I set out to write. And you know, people like it. It's got four and a half stars on Goodreads. <laughs> Uh, I called it agency because it was a really good pun. It was about taking agency back, but I feel like the name probably made people think, uh, especially like a lot of us who are starting these companies have a lot of sort of, that word's got a lot of baggage, right? Like we want to be studios. We want to be, you know, agency implies like sort of a little bit too businessy, but the pun was so good, so I decided I had to do it anyway. Uh, and it was cathartic. It sold pretty well. I still get people emailing me about it all the time, thanking me and telling them their stories. I love that so much. I love these people that just like read the book and they tell them how much it helps their, 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 their company, which is really awesome. After that, I got my wish and I took a job at an internet startup and another job at a VC firm. And I just generally kept going along my life plan. I haven't designed anything in probably 10 years. It helped that I married this wonderful woman. She's up there in the balcony somewhere and she's a great designer. And I wrote a second book about our wedding. I have a guide for men planning weddings. She did the, uh, the, the book cover for it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty great book cover, right? She did a great job. Uh, and the Barbarian Group kept plugging along, um, but there is a coda, and this is a little weird. I've never talked about this, so I'm, I'm getting a little verklempt. But uh, in 2014, rumors started flying around a Korea about the large conglomerate that had bought us, right? In 2015, those rumors burst onto the pages of the Wall Street Journal and other publications, and there's this big scandal. The CEO King of the holding company that bought us was, uh, had died and his family was trying to like, keep control of the company. The, co the company comprised of myriad divisions with an insanely complex stock structure. Some shady trades were maybe made and some people started going to jail, right? And uh, the small teeny division that had bought the Barbarian Group was part of this whole thing. It was roped into the scandal and I, I don't really know how but suddenly the people that had bought the company, that had been our partners at this holding company that we thought were gonna be there were life were out. And there was a whole new world of people that were put in. This company was not expecting it, right? Korean companies are generally not built to suddenly have the CEO and the second in command disappear. They don't really have like people in waiting and like a whole like deep bench like we do. Well, some people do. Anyway, they're gone and they like basically these new people came and they're like, well, we own this weird little company in New York. It doesn't really do anything. What's the, uh, what's the purpose with this, right? And so for five years after I left, the Barbarian Group did great, but within a year it had been laid low by forces completely beyond its control. Ben and Keith had stuck around for a long time, but at this point they had to leave the company. An amazing woman named Sophie, who we had all found together to hire to replace me, she was CEO, she, was, she had to leave the company. And a series of new leaders were brought in, usually Korean, usually didn't know anything about the company, generally financial, and things got dark. The other thing I have to confess is uh, that's literally my secret quote. I said it on background back then, but I feel that's like kind of chicken, so I'm admitting it today. Uh, so about two years ago on Christmas Eve, I left my house without telling my wife, because I get up earlier than she does, and I drove into town where I live now in North Carolina, and I met the nominal American CEO of the parent company that owned the Barbarian Group at this point, right? I was sitting in my car, and I'm like, oh my God, what am I doing? But I offered to buy the company back. Uh, I didn't have the money, but I figured if they said they were interested, I could probably get the money. I had like, you know, I figured I could get Sophie back and I didn't really want to run the company. And I was like sitting in the car and I'm like, what am I doing? This is insane. <laughs> I was freaking out. Why was I doing it? I'd been gone for five years at this point and I didn't really want to do it. It wasn't part of my life plan, but I just felt like I had to do it, right? So in this desolate office, emptied of employees for the holidays, the ironic thing is I took this picture off the internet but if you find the picture right here, this is the guy's office, and he's literally sitting in the office right where he was sitting when I had to talk to him. 
but I cut it out because I thought that was a little too on the nose. But anyway, uh, I told this guy, I came in, I was like, I want to buy my company back. And he's like, well, I don't really blame you, but the truth of the matter is I don't even know who I report to anymore. I'm like, the American CEO, nominally in name only, I don't really have any authority, but I guess I could try and pass it along to whoever's in charge of this place now. Um, so, you know, he tried. It's probably not super surprising that I never heard back, right? <laughs> and I'm still not really sure how I feel about that, right? The, uh, you know, I think it'll be okay either way. Like, my life is going pretty well. I was living in the woods in North Carolina by this point. I was, like, trying to get my health back. And I was like, wow, I don't know if I just dodged a bullet or, like, that's a real bummer. But I think it's okay either way. You know, I was kind of, like, out of it, right? I was living in the woods. But at the same time, I'd been writing a book for the last few years about advertising and economics. I've been consulting for this great startup. I was pretty deep in the world of digital and advertising still. So I figured, like, I could probably step up to do it. But, uh, you know, I was excited about the challenge. But that being said, I feel okay that it didn't work out. A wise monk said, the wheels of chance will turn my way. It was designed by Peter Seville. Uh, since then, the Barbarian Group's gotten like a lot worse, and then now it's getting a little bit better. They've got a new leader now. The name survives. They're trying again. I've talked to her a little bit. I wish them all the best of luck. She seems pretty great. I never really uh, talk about any of this, but Adobe asked me to sort of talk about it, so like, I figured I should probably step up. I figure this is a room filled with really talented designers, and I know that writing from agency, that some of you are probably thinking about this sort of journey, or you've done it, or some of it sounds familiar, and I suspect if that's the case, much of this does, you know, is, well, could be useful to, for you. I'm expecting a baby with my wife this, this uh, fall. <laughs> it's pretty exciting. But, you know, it's interesting, like, uh, some days I think about taking the bio, like, I still have it in my Twitter bio, right? Co-founded Barbarian Group, it's still there, and some days I get angry, especially the last couple of years, I was, like, all angry, I was like, I'm going to take it out, right? I can't do it, it's going to go away. But I, you can't really do it, you know? Like, I, it's, it's like, it feels like a child, and I, I feel like it's out there in the world. I used to think that, like, management was akin to parenthood, right? You're responsible for the livelihood of all these people that work there, and it was really stressful. And I still think that's true, but I think perhaps more so it's true of the company. If you found this company and then it's out there in the world, it's being its own thing, it's making its own decisions, you don't really have any say about it, and it's still tied to you through these invisible bonds, but it's own, its own being now. And I feel like that's kind of a taste of what will come with this child, right? The company's kind of hopefully prepared for me that for a little bit. And if it is, I think I can live with that. There I am, way in the back, and I can use the later laser pointer again. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.